Hi, Kelsey Peach here. Today I want to talk about a very important subject. It's the subject of salvation. But what's salvation all about? Some time ago I was talking to a young man and he said, you know when you talk about being saved, people don't know what you're talking about. And I thought, you know, that's probably true. Uh, and you used to see on churches sometimes the sign, Jesus saves. Well, saves from what to where? What, what's going on? And there's a lot of confusion in the minds of people as to what salvation is all about and who needs to be saved and why and when they need to be saved. And so I thought, uh, let me share with you some ideas and to stimulate your thinking and ask you, if you claim to be a Christian, to think about your role in pointing other people to Jesus if he indeed is worthy of their trust. If there is a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid, then you can have a part, believe it or not, in introducing people to the Lord Jesus Christ and changing their eternal destiny from eternal condemnation into the presence of God forever and ever. And so I want to talk to you about that this morning. But before I get started, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. When I was a young man, I used to be a lifeguard. I was very athletic, believe it or not. And um, I got involved in all kinds of sports. And one of the things I did in the summertime, I loved to swim and I made some records and and, um, but anyway, I became a, a lifeguard and I had to go through a lot of training and be physically fit so I could learn, so I could know how to rescue somebody if they were out there about ready to drown. And it was quite a difficult thing, but I did it and I was a lifeguard for a few summers up in a lake when uh, I was living in Japan. And later on, I became a water safety instructor and taught people not only how to swim, but how to enjoy the water. How all they need really to do is have their nose out of the water and you can survive, even if you know. So as I was thinking about that, and as it relates to salvation or saving somebody, you know, if you go out to the ocean, lifeguards are out there and they, you know, are well trained and hopefully they're in good shape and they could rescue if they needed to, if you needed to be saved or rescued. And so that's one kind of that's one kind of salvation, but then you think about another aspect. You think about firefighters. Uh, a few, I guess, weeks or months ago, it was uh, we went to this picnic, and there were some firefighters there. And I took my grandson with me, and we went over to introduce ourselves to them. And and he was showing us his gear that he has to uh, put on when he and carry on his back when he goes into a building to try to rescue somebody from the fire so they don't perish in the fire. Well, I was really amazed because he told me about the weight, I think it was about 80, 90, 100 pounds maybe of weight that he has to carry onto his body. He has to have a helmet with you know oxygen and all that kind of stuff. And of course, their purpose is to rescue people from having to die in a fire. Well, we should give thanks for people like firefighters and our police force. I know the policemen are getting a lot of uh, bad rap these days. Put yourself in in their shoes. I know of a young man who wants to become a firefighter. I mean, a, a police officer, and uh, <laughs> I was trying to discourage him because you know maybe you are one who don't respect the police. Well, if you obey the laws, you don't usually have to be in trouble with the police. But too often people want to push that. They want to live lawlessly, and that's where usually the problem comes in. When was the last time you thanked a military personnel for? Uh, helping you stay free in this country. We ought to give thanks to, uh, to people like that. Well, you know, as I think about this matter of being saved in heaven and hell, there are some people who deny the existence of God. They call themselves atheists. Well, that's really a foolish thing for anybody to say because they haven't been everywhere in all of the universe to, d to find out if God is or is not there. And the psalmist said in Psalm 14, 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So the next time uh, somebody says, well, I'm an atheist, say, well, uh, that's very interesting. You must be omniscient. Uh, you must have been everywhere. Uh, is that so? Well, 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 well no, 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 I, I haven't. Well, then how can you know for sure that God doesn't exist? You see, just because you claim that he doesn't exist doesn't mean that he doesn't exist. And so it is with heaven and hell. If you, you can say, well, I don't believe in heaven and I don't believe in hell. I believe that when we die, that's the end of us and we just fade out of existence. Well, you can believe that if you want. But if the scriptures are true, and I believe they are, and trustworthy, then we ought to, do, we ought to give good consideration in, from the scriptures as to what we ought to believe. And so that's what we want to talk about today as we think about the matter of salvation. Now, 
When we think about it, uh, you may agree or disagree. If you agree or disagree, please let me know. Please push share or and uh, or like. If you don't like it, just push, you know, let me know, send a comment to me. But let me ask you some questions, if I might. Uh, do you believe in the reality of purgatory? Do you believe there's such a place called paradise? What about limbo? What about the bottomless pit or the abyss? What about Tartarus? Of these that I've just named, which are found in the Bible and which aren't? And um, are there some places that you ought to avoid? Is the lake of fire forever? And these are some questions that we need to ask. What do the scriptures have to say about these things? And is there a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid? Now, you know, John Lennon a number of years ago wrote the song Imagine. If you look at that song and consider that song carefully, it is so filled with falsehood. And yet many people are believing that even in the time of the Olympics, almost every time the Olympics start, that so song is sung. Well, it's wishful thinking, but that's not what the scriptures teach. You know, imagine there's no heaven, imagine there's no hell, you know, imagine there's no consequences for anything that you do. Well, think about that for a minute. If you could get by with whatever you wished or wanted to do, what would you do? That'll give you a pretty good idea of what your sin nature would desire to do. You see, the reason why we don't do certain things is because we realize that in our country there are certain laws that if you violate them, you're, gonna, you're subject to incarceration or maybe even possibly death, which is not very likely these days. But, you know, there are consequences to our behavior. But if you follow his line of thinking and imagine just there's no heaven, there's no hell, and all there is is now, then, you know, why not just, if you don't like somebody, why not just exterminate them? Well, that's what they do in many of these countries around the world. If they don't agree with it, they just, you know, they just, uh, well, who are you? Get rid of you. You see, that's the idea. And you think about communism and socialism and other forms of government. If you disagree with the government, you're in big trouble. See, you could lose your life. And there are many people in our world suffering today as a result of the atheistic evolutionary beliefs that people have taken on themselves. And the reason why they take on this is because they want to live any way that they want without any consequences. And so they follow the big lie. The big lie is that man can become a god and that there's no accountability. So just eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you're going to die. If you can get by with lying, you can buy, get by with cheating or stealing, whatever. You know, so what? You just die and that's the end of it. But wait a minute. Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed for man to die after, sometime after which there is a judgment coming. Yes, there is judgment day coming. It doesn't say as soon as you die you're going to be judged and that's going to determine your entrance into heaven or hell. That's not what the scriptures say. There are different judgments that are mentioned in the scriptures and if you're not, if you don't fit in the right category, you're in big trouble. But at the time of your death or my death, our destiny will have been settled. It's not a matter of you're going up and knocking on heaven's door and say, can I get in, Peter? No, that's not it at all. Your destiny will already have been determined. And we want you to make sure that you are headed for heaven and the basis of your assurance comes from the word of God, not from the word of God, not simply what I have to say to you. Now, there are some people who believe in what's called universalism, that eventually everybody, including the devil and all the demons, and everybody's eventually going to get saved. See, Maybe they have to go through a purgatory for a while, you know, and even they think, you know, even one of the former popes said, you know, they asked him, do you think, do you think you're going to go right away to heaven? He says, no, but he says, I have 700 million Roman Catholics praying for me. So, you know, I'll probably not spend too long there. Well, no, either you're going to go to heaven at the moment you die, or you're going to be going to a place called Hades before you get thrown later on into the lake of fire. And we don't want you or anyone else to go to that awful place. And you don't have to, my friend. And that's what the scriptures say. God the Father so loved the world, that includes you and me, all the people of the world. He loved all the people, sinners and those who have less sin. We've all sinned and come short of the glory. God the Father loved the people of the world that he gave his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the way, volunteered to come to this earth. He wasn't pushed. He wasn't shoved fighting. And, oh, I don't, want to go, I don't want to go to the cross and die. No, he voluntarily came to this earth to glorify God the Father and to demonstrate his love for the Father by being willing to die for your sins and mine as a substitute for our sins. And he had to be perfect himself. He had to be sinless for him to die as our substitute. Had he sinned, 
he would have had to die for his own sin. But you see this idea of universalism that is being taught and it is being it was promoted and is being promoted by a fellow who used to be a missionary kid in Indonesia. I think it was, yeah, Indonesia I think it was. And uh, he had a bad experience as a child. And so he went to get counsel and he turned his whole philosophy and his view of God and, and salvation and everything got changed around. And he's teaching universalism today. Maybe you've read his book or gone to see the movie, The Shack. Uh, he has so distorted what the scriptures have to say. I'd rather stick with the scriptures, my friend, than believe the lie that he is perpetrating on people who are going to end up forever in the lake of fire. Because they believe that it doesn't matter what you believe or anything like it. Yes, my friend, it does. Christ didn't come in vain to this earth to die for our sins and just say, well, you know, it doesn't matter. You're all going to go to heaven anyway. You know, you are either, you either are a child of the devil or you're a child of God. And that's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again from above. And the way you are born again from above is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died as you as a substitute for your sins who was buried for three days and three nights who rose again on the third day bodily who was seen by over 500 witnesses for 40 days before ascending back into heaven this same jesus is going to come back and he is going to rule as the king of kings and the lord of lords and he's going to reign on into eternity that's the one in whom i'm trusting and i hope that's the one in whom you're trusting if you want to go to heaven now this is what the scriptures teach you see all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of god Jesus talked about heaven. He talked about hell. And if they're not real places, then he's a liar. I don't want to trust in somebody who lies to me. No, they're real places. And I would, I would rather trust somebody who was, who was crucified, who was put in a tomb for three days, who rose again. I would rather trust in a person like that than somebody who may have had some near-death experience and come back and say, well, you know, you know I, this is my experience. There was a, a father who had a son who had this experience, supposedly, and he misled a lot of people. I don't know if he ever changed his view after that and told people that it was a hoax, you know. But the, you stick with the scriptures because the scriptures are the truth. John 17, 17, Jesus in his high priestly prayer said, Your word is truth. This book, the 66 books of the Bible, and that alone are God-breathed. They're profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God might be perfect, thoroughly equipped unto all good works. You see, God saves us for a purpose. He saves us to bring glory to himself, to let the rest, all of his creatures know that he is a good and he's a righteous God. He's also loving and merciful and gracious. See? But you see, when God told Adam and Eve that if they ate of that forbidden fruit, they would die, Physically and spiritually, the devil came and he told him a, a lie. He said, now, it's true, if you, if you eat this fruit, you'll become like God, knowing the difference to good, between good and evil. That was true. The lie was, you won't die. Well, they didn't know what death was. But when they ate of that forbidden fruit, something tragic happened. Uh, they lost something, I believe, that could have been their garment of light. And they began to die physically and a number of years neighbor, in fact, 900 years before the flood, they lived much longer than we do because of certain conditions that existed on the earth prior to the time of the flood. But nevertheless, you see, there's a problem. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all deserve to be separated from God. But my, father, my friend, God the Father loved you. I don't care whether you're living in India, in South America, in Africa, in Asia. It doesn't matter. I've shared this with you in Japanese because I learned it John 3.16. So that's John 3.16. If you get a Gideon Bible, if you go to a hotel sometime, usually they have John 3.16 in many, many translations. And as they meet in the Olympics, they have many people gathered together from different nations and they speak different languages. You know, the Japanese uh, incorporated uh, their Chinese characters, but they pronounce them differently, but, and sometimes the meanings are different, but the Japanese language is difficult because it has two other kinds of characters, in addition to the Chinese characters. And my dad, who knew Japanese fluently and, and very well, he said to read a Japanese newspaper, you need to be able to read at least 5,000 Chinese characters. Well, I'm glad <laughs> he knew how to do it, but I, I could speak it pretty well, but I can't read it or write it very well. But nevertheless, my point is, we don't discriminate against people because of their different ethnicity or their language differences than ours. 
No, we want you no matter where you are. And I don't know where you are right now or what you're doing or why you happen to stumble across my talk right now with you. But my friend, I'm interested in you. And it's very possible that you might be the last person who's going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And when that number is complete, the scriptures say that God the Son will come back. The Lord Jesus Christ will come back to receive those people who are here on earth. He will catch us up to meet him in the air, after which, some, after which time a lot of bad things are going to happen before Jesus Christ comes back to rule as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. My friend, there is no time for you to waste. You have no guarantee that you will be alive at the end of today. I think of that young football player that I think was a week or two ago. Um, he wasn't planning on dying. Apparently an illegal uh, guy was in the country driving, killed him. You don't know that. When you drive down the road, I oftentimes think, I'm going 55, they're coming to 55. That's a 110 mile impact. Or you could die in your sleep. It's appointed for men to die once, after which judgment is coming. Now that's a general rule, because there's going to be an exception to that rule. And it happened in the Old Testament when Enoch was taken from this life into the next same way with Elijah. And they are perhaps examples of the rapture that's going to take place. I'm not planning on dying physically. I want to get taken up in the rapture. I tell my 96-year-old mother-in-law, I, when I tell her that, hey, Jesus may come today, wouldn't that be great? And she, she gets a smile on her face. And I want you to enjoy eternal life that can be yours right now as a, per, as a present possession. You don't have to wait until you die to get eternal life. That's God's quality of life. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now the health, wealth, happiness, guys, tell you that's talking about material, physical things. No, it's talking about spiritual things primarily. God will supply the needs of his children because his own reputation is at stake, but he's not going to give you necessarily everything that you crave that your sin nature wants. No, not at all. Well, anyway, the only requirement for your getting into heaven or my getting into heaven is something so simple that feels, oh, it can't be limited to that. But the scriptures make it very clear in Acts 16, 31, when the apostle Paul was asked the question by the Philippian jailer who said, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe, believe, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. The word believe. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord means he's God. Jesus refers to his humanity, the fact that he's the Savior. Christ means he's the anointed Messiah, that he's the resurrected, glorified one who ascended up in heaven. That's the only kind of a person that can save you. A dead person can't save you. All these other religious leaders, they're dead. But Jesus Christ validated his resurrection from the dead by appearing to over 500 witnesses before ascending back into heaven. And then when he's going up there, the two angels say to the guys that are still there, why are you looking up into heaven? The same Jesus that went up is coming back again. See? And you say, oh, well, it's been 2,000 years. He's not coming back. You're just crazy. Well, he's just long-suffering and patient, maybe waiting for you to believe on him before it's eternally too late. Yeah, there's, uh, there's X number of people. We don't know. We don't find somebody with a stamp on their head saying, well, this person's going to believe and this person's not. We don't. So I try to witness to people wherever I go. And um, I try to share the gospel as often as I can because I don't know who those people are. But I want them to hear the good news that Christ died for their sins like he did for mine. He was buried for three days and nights and he rose again bodily on the third day. And any and all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life with God forever. I want to have that. I know I have that because I have placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And if I perchance ended up in hell, I could point my finger at God and say, your word was not truth. I'm here in hell. Why am I here? I believed in your son as my Savior. Now, it's more than just knowing the facts of the gospel. You see, for many years, I knew the facts. I believed the facts. You can believe the facts of Christ. You ask some modernist who you know, believes a lot of false things about Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins or died for you and rose again? Oh, yeah, I believe that. But they will say, well, I don't think that's enough. You must add your good works. Well, that's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, when he said, you're believing in vain. You believe in vain when you add the word and or but. So I have to believe in Jesus, but or and I have to do this, see. 
I have to be, uh, I have to be baptized. I have to go to church. I have to pay. I have to do this. I, no, 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 no. It's believe. Now, some people say, well, that's just easy believism. Well, let me quote, let me read the words of Dr. Charles Ryrie, who uh, wrote these book, uh, wrote these words in his uh, book. In fact, if you go to my article that is associated with this, it's uh, called So Great Salvation. Let me read what he has to say here. He says, when we Christians ask someone to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are asking something very difficult. We are asking the person to believe in someone he or she has never seen. Someone who lived in the distant past, very distant past. Someone who has no living eyewitnesses who can vouch for his character and the truth of his words. Someone whose biography was written very long ago and by those who were his friends. Think about that. Is that easy to believe? Is it easy for a person to believe that he can put his faith and trust in a person he's never seen? I've never seen Jesus personally, but I believe the testimony of others who did see him, which has been passed down to me. I know the transformation that has taken place in my life from what I used to be to where I am today. Oh, I'm not sinless, but I can tell you honestly, I sin less than I used to sin. And the reason is because I've received a new nature from a divine nature from God himself, which causes me to want to do what's right. And when I sin as a Christian, I am commanded and told to confess my sins. If I should confess my sins to God the Father, then he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness that led up to my sinnings. You see, before you ever sin, you trespass. You engage in unrighteousness. And when you sin, when you engage in activity, then you have to confess that sin to the Father. Now, there's one guy who says, well, you don't have to confess your sins because at the time of your salvation, you had all your sins forgiven. That is absolutely not true. There's judicial forgiveness that takes place at the time of your salvation, if you're saved. But there's family forgiveness that, takes, that needs to take place when you sin against the Father. When you do things that you know you're not supposed to do, which he has clearly spelled out in his word. Now, when you think about it, my friend, uh, I think about sporting events. When these big men who need no exercise, I think of a football game, 22 guys out there on the field. Uh, they're in great physical shape, being watched by thousands and thousands of people in the stadium who need a lot of exercise, making millions and millions of dollars. I recently read of a young man who's, I think, in figure 160 some million dollars. He's going to be paid over a five-year period and guaranteed this. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, suppose I were that. Well, I, I, would like, I would like to, you know, get that kind of money myself. Well, I tell you what, if you got that kind of money, you got the lottery, it'd be very easy for you to act independently of God and not to learn to trust God. You know, it says we're saved by an act of faith, but we're to live in an attitude of faith. You know, having the Lord Jesus Christ and God as my Father, the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, the Holy Spirit is my comforter and my teacher. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I mean that, honestly. Because if you have Jesus, really, what else do you need? You have him. And so the scripture says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, if he gains five or six you know, Super Bowl rings, or he makes a multi-million dollar, uh, he gets a multi-million dollar contract? What is it good? What good does it do? Think about, think about the money these guys are making to hit little golf balls or tennis balls or, or basketballs or footballs or soccer balls. You know, it's, it's just amazing. And I'm, I'm not opposed to sports, but you know, you can, a Christian can get to the place where he loves these things, these activities, more than he loves God. And that's why 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Paul writes, or John the Apostle writes, and he says, you maturing believers, stop loving the world system. Why? It's passing away. It appeals to your senses, yeah. But it's all passing. You can enjoy it, but don't abuse it. See, use it, but don't abuse it. And so we need to recognize that the world system is one of our enemies that the devil devised to try to control the sin nature that we all have. Well, we're here for you. We want you to know for sure that if you died today, you'd go to heaven. And I would encourage you, if you're not sure about your eternal salvation, or if you might possibly be believing in vain, that you simply go to my website. It's just kelseypeach.com, which you can see it above here. And you go to the bad news and the good news. It's this little booklet right here, written by Dr. Ron Shea. Excellent. It has uh, 
kind of pictures and so forth, and it's an easy read. But my friend, your eternal destiny is going to be determined by what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you reject him, you're going to be eternally lost. Now, you know, you say, well, what about the people who have never heard of Jesus? Well, creation tells us that there is a God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Uh, Romans chapter 1 says that people refuse to acknowledge God's existence. They are thankful to him. They don't search after him. But they could know God if they chose to know God. But they love, John 3, 19, it says they love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. My friend, there's no excuse for any of us. You see, God can see to it that a person who responds to natural revelation and says, I want to know more about God. God might use a missionary who spends many years learning that person's language. He might use a gospel tract, such as this one right here, that's God's simple plan of salvation. It's in 122 languages, over 550 million copies, I think, of this have gone out. You could get some of these. I usually take some of these in Japanese when I go to Japan. I have some in Spanish. I have some in other languages. And you could get a hold of this. My friend, have you ever led another person, if you're saved, have you ever led another person to the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved? I think of Andrew. You probably don't know much about it, but he was the one that led his brother Peter to the Lord. And Peter, in turn, after he failed the Lord miserably, denying him, the Lord forgave him, restored him. On the day of Pentecost, he preached, and over 3,000 people came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you may not be able to do what an evangelist does. I'm not an evangelist. I, am a, I believe I'm a Bible teacher. But I know how to evangelize. I know what the gospel is. I know what it isn't. I know there are a lot of people that are preaching the social gospel. They're not preaching the good news concerning Christ, that he died for our sins and was buried and rose again. They're teaching that you have to add something or you have to subtract something. My friend, the gospel is not Christ died for you because you're such a wonderful person. And if you don't teach the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you don't share the bodily resurrection of Christ, then you don't have a living Savior who can help anybody. You see, Paul spelled it out very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. This is the good news. Christ died for our sins. My sins and your sins. Why? Because we're all sinners. He was buried for three days and three nights. Why? Had he been dead for four days like Lazarus, his body would have started to corrupt and decay. And the scripture said his body was not going to decay or corrupt. And he rose again bodily. No, there are some cults that don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. My friend, if there's no bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have no hope of ever being raised from the dead either. I don't want to spend eternity in the body that I currently have. I'm thankful for what I do have. I'm thankful, I'm thankful that I can still think and I can still talk and share this with you. But I want a much, much better body than what I have now. The best I now don't have my best life now. It's coming. I know what the smiley preacher said. Your best life now. Tell that to people in the communist countries or in, in Muslim countries. Their best life is not now. They're willing to die for their faith. The martyrs of the past are willing to die. We're willing to die so that you and I could be saved. So let's think about it. You, ha If you're saved, if you're not saved, please make sure. Please go to my website and read the bad news and the good news. It's right there. You just go to my site and you can click on that. Read it. Take a few minutes. It's the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. The second one is who you marry. But that's the most important decision is to trust in Christ as your personal Savior. Then once you have been saved... You can have the assurance that comes from the Word of God. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, verse 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God, that you might know that you have eternal life. You don't have to wish, hope, or think. You can know that you have eternal life right now. Would you like that? I wanted that. I really did. I told you last time I was talking about, like the guy who went to see Socrates. What do you want? I want wisdom. And he pushed him out of the water. He says, what do you want? And he had almost drawn the guy. He says, I want air. He says, when you want it that badly, you'll find it. And maybe God has brought you, my friend, to this point right now where maybe you're going on pretty well. Maybe you think you're doing pretty good. But my friend, what's going to happen when you die? Where are you going to spend eternity? It's something that we all need to think about. Well, 
we're glad that uh, I'm glad that you joined me today, and I hope that you will. If this has been helpful to you, I have some other. If you go to my uh, website and go to my corresponding uh, article that I wrote with reference to this, I have given you a point where you can click on. Uh, it's called Lordship in Exchange for Salvation, and I've also given you given you a reference to Dr. Charles Ryrie's book, So Great Salvation. If you'd like to secure that for yourself, you can just click on that. And uh, there's another one that you could read that was written by Dr. Uh, Manfred Kolber, and it's uh, called, Do We Really Understand the Gospel? And I'd encourage you to make some time. I know you're probably very busy like a lot of re the rest of the people, but my friend, what profit would it be if you'd got all these other things and you lost your own soul? and ended up in hell. We don't want that to happen to you or anyone else. But you can help us get this good news out by simply pushing share and like. If you don't like what I said, please write me. I don't care. Write to me. Tell me where you disagree. And um, we can agree, uh, we can disagree, you know, without fighting each other and trying to kill each other, right? We don't want that. I want to share with you what I have received by the grace of God. It's amazing grace. How sweet that sound that saved a wretch like me. And so until next time, my friend, this is Kelsey Peach asking God's blessing upon you as you are obedient to him and his word.